Hello and welcome to season two of the Brass Junkies. We've decided that season one is was two hundred episodes, and uh, and and Lance was going to uh, to step down. He he's been uh, you know looking to do that for about a year now, uh, but he has changed his mind. So uh, Lance, how, how are you today? I'm great. I'm taking a little time out of writing my fourteenth book on articulation on the euphonium. <laughs> As well, I've made 16 videos about choosing a mouthpiece to play a low C. <laughs> That's very, very on brand for you. That's, oh my goodness. So uh, underneath that mask <laughs> is, is well, my first, before we do the unveil, even though it's been in all the marketing materials, uh, I thought I wanted a really big name to uh, to help me to co-host the first time uh, for uh, you know for for season two as I'm calling it and so I immediately thought of Michael Martin uh, because he'd be he would be great but he's too busy uh, like on like you know like the HGTV he's like on House Hunters he's like a, he's a TV star now so he doesn't even uh, re- he doesn't even return my texts anymore because he's big time so uh, so I thought okay well who 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 could I get that's definitely going to return my texts and I thought you know what. I guess Chris Martin would uh, would do okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, the unveil, the principal trumpet of the New York Philharmonic, Chris Martin. How are you? I'm great. It's good to see you, Andrew. Thanks for good. having me here. It's good to be seen. Uh, I got a little nervous, which is exactly why he did it, when he told me that he had a prompt. <laughs> and I believe I said, oh, dear God, what have I done? That was the text back. And then uh, the Lance mask was, uh, that, that, is a, uh, that is a nice touch. So... Um, so we, you've got, uh, we're going to actually ask you about this during the bonus episode, uh, but you've got a brand new hall. Like, I can't wait to hear, uh, some thoughts about that, which is, um, which is very exciting. I saw a very colorful wall. I saw like a video of Colin Williams warming up in front of this, like, yeah, it's like some, some really cool stuff. So I can't wait to unpack that. And we are talking to Joe Bergstaller today. Like talk about prolific. My goodness. His bio just goes on and on and on. I had to take a nap after I read it. <laughs> I can't wait. To, I mean, he has he has played in orchestral sections. He's soloed in front of major orchestras. He is a chamber musician. He's an entrepreneur. Um, he played, uh, you know, principal trumpet in uh, Canadian brass. I mean, he's got like, and he's also one of the genuinely sweetest people that you could ever hope to meet. So I'm uh, I'm really looking forward to our conversation with him. Uh, I did want to take a moment to thank Parker Mouthpieces for providing the hosting for the Brass Junkies. Parker Mouthpieces offers fine, customizable component mouthpieces for horn, trombone, euphonium, and tuba, including the Andrew Hits Artist Model Tuba Mouthpiece. And also, uh, the Lance LeDuc Model Euphonium Mouthpiece has been updated that you can actually play it while wearing a a full uh, a full mask. <laughs> you can find out more at ParkerMouthpieces.com or follow them on Facebook, Instagram. And Twitter. All right. Uh, wow. if, if your heart is content, Chris, then uh, then let's uh, let's get to the uh, to the conversation uh, that we had with Joe. Yeah, let's do it. And today on the Brass Junkies, I am joined by two trumpet players. I don't know what I'm thinking. I'm uh, I'm I'm like uh, this is like a brass quintet, except I don't have my two allies with me. It's like I've uh, yeah, this is this, this I'm questioning the life decisions that have brought me to this moment. But no, Chris and I are joined by Joe Bergstaller. Joe, how are you? I'm great, friends. How are you? Good. Good doing, to see you. Doing OK. Great to see you. So this would we... be the least successful brass trio in- or instrumentation ever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, it's well, too... a- a- I don't know. Andrew, don't get, let this get to your head, but um, we, we did a, a, a brass quintet session here at ASU on Wednesday, mm-hmm. and um, we were coaching Bram Tovey's Santa Barbara Sonata, which I highly recommend. And I told them my philosophy of a, a quintet and and just breathe. Um, I think the tuba players uh, are... are by far of you know the brass family by far the best musicians and i I think they should always lead the quintet um and my philosophy around that is i I, my theory at least is that um you know like coming up in a band world like most composers just kind of write real simple parts for tuba right that's for sure And, Mm -hmm. and then as we mature as musicians then we know that simple is the hardest right and so like 
we can't touch pianists or violinists in that respect. They've been they've been studying such deep literature for so many more decades than we, as we're trying to get scales out. Except tuba players really had to learn how to to phrase and and focus on tone and and make the most music out of the least notes. And I, I think and then tr as trumpet players on the other end of the spectrum, we have so many notes, we can hide behind those and we don't make much music often until later on in, in our maturity. <laughs> um, and then I, I find like, especially with younger quintets or older quintets, as soon as we adopt that philosophy and it's like the tube is the leader, they're driving the bus. Um, I think trombonists of any age have the best sound. And I think it's maybe because they have the least number of valves to deal with. So it's always kind of a straight blow. Mm -hmm. um, and they get used to like a uniformity of, of great sound across registers where we're kind of um, navigating a highway full of potholes, you know, <laughs> with valves and, and and not just emotionally. Yeah. <laughs> and different resistances and everything. So I, I and then the horn player is as the kind of the point guard of that group, you know, and then the <laughs> trumpet players. I and it's it's amazing as long as soon as you define the roles or redefine the roles like that because usually everyone thinks like trumpets are you know the leaders that's interesting all of a sudden it just transforms the group um it solidifies you know the mm. i prefer tuba at the bottom versus bass bone although i've had great bass bones in my quintet like john lofton in la and mm -hmm. um but it yeah i feel so the same about that yeah. I, I agree i think tubas too tubas have a they have a a fundamental understanding of of a piece of music that that we don't sit down on the top you know yeah. sort of i find often that uh like in terms of in terms of like large scale structure um al bear is always he's always he'll always school me on something he'll say no yeah the first time you played it you played it this way now this time should we do something a little different I'm like well that was 20 minutes ago how do you remember that <laughs> He's yeah. been resting. All he's been thinking about for the last 19 minutes was how you played that 20 minutes ago. That, we could make people's heads explode if I had the two of you, without me even prompting it, just talk about tubas and tuba playing for the full hour. That would be, I would get some angry email. Well, it would be spectacular. I mean, is, the lore is that, you know, Al Bear had the, the best brass audition in the history of the New York Philharmonic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've heard that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, for and, uh, for what it's worth, that story he, uh, did come around before Chris auditioned, just like just so that he doesn't suddenly have technical <laughs> difficulties and storm off. Yeah, but it, and mute. <laughs> See you guys. <laughs> uh, so Joe, you just reminded me of um, when I interviewed uh, Sam Palafian, whose office used to be right down the hall from where you are sitting right now uh, at Arizona State University. Uh, I interviewed him for uh, the, a book I did called The Band Director's Guide to Everything Tuba, a collection of interviews with the experts. And he gave, uh, he talked about teaching, um, and actually this is going to lead, uh, let's pretend like I did this on purpose. He, this okay. is going to lead perfectly into a question that Chris wants to ask you, uh, so I'll hand it off to him. But uh, <laughs> Sam talked about, um, about teaching uh, tuba players how to improvise. And, uh, and he was, because it's Sam, uh, he did not teach you how to like teach your like, you know, once a decade or, or once a career, like really good tuba kid how to improvise because that's like useful, but not that useful. He taught how to like how to teach just your average high school tuba player and talked about like getting them to learn how to just play bass lines a little bit. And then and then this was like the real Jedi, you know, the, the Yoda stuff here was when he talked about how you then put that kid back into concert band and about how playing a march that they start without even labeling it, they start hearing and playing in eight and 16 bar phrases because mm -hmm. they're kind of like hearing what, you know, how, how it's driving the bus. And um, yeah, it was, it was brilliant. Uh, it was really brilliant. And then it was funny cause I'm talking to him and then I'm actually reliving some of the pedagogy that he did to me when at that young age, you know, I started working when I was 14. It's not like he was explaining the pedagogy. He was just like, leading me through and then so it was very meta when i'm then like layering like what he did i was like oh 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 yeah so modeling I, yeah modeling yep. through it I, yep. I i mean the improvisation gets us into reclaiming musical responsibility right i i think uh usually like in, in a i call it a large ensemble trance and we're trained you know so mm -hmm. early on just to kind of like seed all responsibility um and energy uh making to to the conductor and that's not what conductors want, right? right. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, you even see it at the pro level, a lot of times, just kind of like a, a lot of zoned out people just going, you know. Mm -hmm. um, 
but yeah, I, getting into improv kind of, it, it re-engages them, right? Like, um, it's like a co-creating instead of a recreating. It's a, it's understanding of the composition from within. Um, and you have to, uh, you know, the bottom is a whole misnomer, isn't it? It's, it's, I don't, cause bottom comes with the connotation that it's a, a lesser kind of role, um, but it's the foundational role. Maybe that's a better way to put it, right? Yeah. I find I, I find that a, a, a lot of people who who only do only play in band only in orchestra only sort of classical, they their music making tends to be visually driven. Like they, they see what's on the page and they try to execute what's on the page to the to the exclusion really of their ear. And yeah. I think you're part of what you're saying that I that I, that's really exciting to me is that when when someone journeys into improvisation, it's it becomes ear driven, right? Like the, the ear and the listening, not only listening to the piece and the harmony, but listening to how you fit in the group, that that becomes the front, which I, I, it's really exciting to me. So, yeah, my well, question was, my that's question the way was, you play, obviously. I mean, you, well, you are, you're a call and response guy. Yeah, but I but I think that's that's not something to your point that, that comes naturally in the in the concert band world or in the in the symphony orchestra world. I think we're we're trained to to execute, you know, what's on the page. Uh, when the conductor says, but you're absolutely right. That's what the best conductors in the world. That's not what they want. No. They want partners. Yeah. So my question is, how do you, how do you teach improvisation to a super square classical musician who, when they think about improvising, pees their pants? I'm asking for a friend. <laughs> and maybe, maybe say one who has a one month old at home. Maybe. <laughs> hey, we're expecting a baby boy in January. Hey, first. congratulations. Thank you. Fantastic. I should have told you that earlier. We should have opened with that. <laughs> That's why you look so rested. <laughs> <laughs> you know, people keep saying that like that. that it's interesting. There's there. Uh, speaking of Lord, it, it does it go to kind of like, well, wait until the baby comes. You will not sleep. I feel differently. And let, I'm glad I'm putting it on video and then we can come back to it and you can make fun of me later if you'd like. But I don't, I've been sleep deprived for the last 30 years, you know, um, and, in, yeah. you know, like, it, honestly, it, Joe, it, it's not that different. It's no, not that different. Like, yeah. like for us, like we're, we're all night owls anyway, right? Like, yeah. It's yeah. impossible for us. I can't go to bed before midnight most of the time anyway. You come home well, from that's because we're artists. 11, yeah. But that, I mean, we're, our, we're geared towards the evening, right? Yeah. But then also uh, there's a whole thing about uh, uh, an artist's mind, right? Like the, the creative, the creative juice comes in about two o'clock in the morning. Um, and the Ayurvedics call that, uh, what is it, kapha energy, right? You shouldn't, that's the renewal energy. You shouldn't spend too much of it. But like mm -hmm. all my best composing and arranging happens then. It's just, the, the struggle is staying up till then. So I set the alarm for one thirty. You know, He's about that's to cool. become like, not only Joe Bergstahl, as we know him, he's going to, be able to become this prolific arranger and compose. You know, like how is he? How's he publishing a piece every other week? What's happening? It's like, oh, he has a newborn. Yeah, that because that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it was I, a great question, so you, Chris. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, I was just saying you you'll perfect the move where you you hold the bottle, you get the baby bottle in your chin, and then you just play it over here. Yes, yeah. I've done that many times. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, except if your like stamp is like you know if it's choppy, the baby gets pissed. Yeah, so it's like you know you gotta, you gotta yeah you gotta you gotta play. It'll, it'll help you with your slurs. You know, help you. Newborn, just, like... Newborns newborns don't like lip bends. They're not a fan <laughs> of lip bends. You know, <laughs> have you have you found uh, have you tried yet uh, Fritz Damrau's shape up? Yeah, I have. Yeah, I love. That's well, he's, I love Fritz, but there's also I, I, it's it's great stuff, and and it reminds me of of. Uh, the SNL sketch up, um, uh, Hans und Franz. I can yeah, say this because yeah. I'm Austrian, you know, like the, the whole thing where they, they, Arnold Schwarzenegger is their, their cousin and we're going to pump you yeah, up. You up yeah, That's yeah. what reminded me the whole shape up thing. I, Isn't that the book with the big arm on the cover? Yeah. 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 It's good we're stuff. We're going to do lip bins now. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what it was about our schedules, but uh, Boston Brass, like a decade ago, like we used to run into Fritz uh, in like we ran into him in like half a dozen foreign countries. It was just like one of those things where just our sketch, we just kept on appearing and he's like, he's such a sweet guy. Yeah, yeah he's uh, and obviously just a monster of a, of a player. And I've never yeah. seen him teach, but I have a feeling that he is just as good uh, of a teacher as he is a player. I think so. so absolutely. All right, you've avoided the uh, you've avoided the question long well, enough. Well, actually, no, no, I've I've gotten right into it, and it's it's about conversation. 
All right. So, um, so back when I was here at ASU and, and a student, I would beg and barter with local band directors because uh, I wanted to learn how to be a soloist. And I, I'd offer them free clinics and master classes if I could solo with the band. And they all said yes. They all needed help. I needed the help. And I did about 10 of those a semester. Wow. It's uh, parallel kind of to what Deanna did, you know, with her tuba rap thing. Mm -hmm. And um, so, and the reason I'm mentioning that is one of the, the clinics I would do is uh, improvisation for classical musicians. So I was doing it back then. And the reason I was able to teach it because we just teach what we know. And I came up um, learning by ear. So um, a little background and then a little uh, how to teach it is, is that like, I played harmonica first when I was three. My parents were not musicians. Um, they didn't have that choice in their lives, but um, my father started learning the harmonica and that was a, an era of amazing stuff on, on the radio, right? For a trumpet mm. player, that was amazing. Mm. Um, so, but also I was into what we would have called at that point Dixieland music, which is not a great term for it. Um, but I, I was playing that on harmonica by ear and then cornet about a year later, uh, maybe four and a half or five, and, and I was still playing by ear. And then I had to learn later on um, that about a, a half a year later, I joined the high school band and as last year and no one should be impressed because it's not like I was any good. It was just the, the theory of community in an ensemble. Right. And so then I had to kind of blend my approach in, into not just going by ear alone, but, but learning what notes meant. And then what was really difficult for me was, um, putting letters with notes. And my head still doesn't wrap around key signatures. Like I, I would have to go and play the scale in my head and count the sharps or flats. I can't do that. Um, <laughs> did you I, grow up? Uh, you, you have perfect pitch, Joe. No, I don't believe in it. Hmm. Um, just to tra just a train deer. Yeah, I think the, I, I think perfect pitch is really interesting. I just think um, an interesting concept. But for what's what's perfect pitch? I mean. Is it 440, 442? Um, I wonder that often. 444. Well. I hear, I, you know, if, if if I don't put a tuner on, I'm usually flat to a tuner. I hear more like Baroque pitch is where I want to go. Um, mm -hmm. And so I'm not going to tell anyone, you know, you know, I'm not going to tell Fritz, like, okay, you play at 444, but like if you have perfect pitch, then you're wrong. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I think there's great relative pitch. And I, I mm -hmm music is it shouldn't have any absolute gotcha. um, but so the, with the improv thing that's how i came to it um and and so it's not like i have a sean jones vocabulary or winton vocabulary or anything near that um so i don't think any of my friends in that that part of the business would call me a jazz musician um, but but when I but when I hear you play when I hear you play classically or or sort of jazz or crossover thing all these things that you do so well when I hear you play I hear somebody who plays you you play by ear and but and and I and you really play you like what you hear in your head is what's coming out of the bell and I think that that applies to that applies to harmony to melody but that also applies to your sound the sounds you make the articulations you use the colors like the like your palette your spectrum of color on the trumpet which is you know the trumpet is notoriously narrow right in terms of the the expressive color but yours is huge it's as wide as anybody i've ever heard can you write that down yeah it'll be in the show notes guys <laughs> copy and paste no we should just stop the show now i got everything i need to... i'm actually I, for what it's worth i thought that was a little rambling so i'm going to cut it so, yeah. <laughs> well it's it's Chris, thank you, and I'm humbled, and that's I think that's what we all aspire to, right? You know, yeah. um, and so I guess my first point is that, that the the background, the way we're taught, and I, I'm wondering this about you too, since you, you know you came from a musical family. That, did you learn by ear, or, or did you learn notation first? Um, I, I learned by ear, just yeah. just being immersed in the in the band world and the drum and bugle core world, yeah. um, and I. I didn't. I didn't read music. I, I was. I was trying to play a trumpet or a bugle, G bugle, long before I could read music, um, and I was just trying to match the sounds I, I grew up with. Um, so I, 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 you know, I, I'm not a. I'm not. I'm by no means uh, even close to being able to improvise 
uh, well, but I, but I grew up also in the jazz band world and, and I grew up in big band. And, and so for me, like, for me, like the uh, playing by ear had more to do with tone and color than it did with, you know, harmony and, and, yeah. uh, and that. Well, that makes a lot of sense now, um, knowing more about your background, because I mean, that's all very evident in your playing, you know, yep. um, your playing is not, <laughs> your playing is very wide and, and never narrow. And, and, you know, everything you, you accuse me of is what I would say that, that you have in your playing and which is what I admire about you, that your voice is very strong. Um, and, and, and I, I don't even know how to describe it except it's always beautiful. And all, you. you're always saying something and it's always interesting and it's always, com there's always complexity in your sound, which I really, really admire. Um, this is getting weird. Two trumpet players being nice to each other. <laughs> I got a, I have a question, follow a follow on question. Yeah, but Did it's you, interesting. Like when we met, is. we vibed, it was nice. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Very nice. Yeah. Do you, do you sing? Do you, do you sing? And did, by extension, do you have your students sing? All the time. Yeah. Yeah, I, I call it my my fake opera voice, uh, you know, and, and remember the old Bo Jackson commercial, Bo knows, yeah. Bo oh, knows yeah. baseball. Yeah. And yeah. he did a He did. There's like a three second thing where you go, oh, right. <laughs> and that's Bo. So but my students laugh that, that, that that's that's the example we're using for <laughs> Joe uh, the, sound. We are now we are now yeah, we. <laughs> Season two kicks off with Joe Bergstaller impersonating Bo Jackson impersonating an opera singer. That's uh, opera singer. getting yeah. super meta. I love it. That's how you so, get the Bergstaller sound. <laughs> <laughs> you got to hear Bo Jackson in your head and then just make that come out of your bell. That's easy. Chris, um, that's what Chris Martin does. Yeah, he's just hearing Bo Jackson. Uh, <laughs> oh, it works. Exactly. It's great. Where's my mouthy? Yeah. So how to teach it? Um, it I think most mostly there's um I think probably if every human being improvises right and and mostly we don't think about it because we're speaking right mm. and so we're all we have a vocabulary and we use and we have a repository of knowledge and then we we speak extemporaneously using those 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 things and we never think about that that as improvisation but it is improvisation it's call and response we've been doing it here and so I think the first hurdle to get over, if, and you're, you're correct, I think that, and maybe I'll state it stronger, that the, mostly um, classical musicians are not exposed to that early on, um, mm -hmm. this notion of, of call and response. And mostly it's kind of, it, it's, I'm not even sure how to, to, to describe it, but yeah, by, this, by the time I got to them in high school, bands when I was here as a student, there was already an assumption or let's say a limiting belief that I can't improvise, right? Um, so from that's not even talking about music, that's just talking about the concept of improvisation. So I would lead them kind of to it. And that's still what I do when I teach those things um, in groups. And so I would start with theater exercises. And the theater exercise would be just a uh, making up a story and the the it would be as easy as that I would point at a student I would tell them the rules ahead of time point at the student and they had I would start a story like Greg was walking down the street one day and was sunny out and and then I would point it at, at a student and then they would have to continue and I would keep my finger pointed at them and then as soon as I take it off I, they have to stop immediately and the, and it's always in mid-sentence and then I point it at the next student and they would have to pick up and sometimes they would keep rolling with the previous student's idea and sometimes they would go a hard left or a hard right and then they'd have to adjust and 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 they got into a rhythm and they um without me stating it they were starting to understand that yeah they're improvising they're going back and forth then I, the next iteration would be a metronome at 60 and then we would define an order across the entire band usually back row across left and right to the front and then back again everyone said one word in the story and then we would up the metronome right um and so get faster until we got to kind of sentence cadences you know like normal speech cadence um and then um i'm a huge bob mcferrin fan and and he at that point he was already doing the circle songs which i thought were brilliant like you like 
when he does that or did that, then it was like watching him from inside, right? So if our audience doesn't know what a circle song is, and Bob McFerrin, that it, he would improvise or dictate to, uh, he would have like usually six singers in his group, and you can find the CDs and videos about this, and he, he would dictate a groove or a melody or some loop to one of his singers who would immediately pick it up and then they would repeat that and then he would dictate another one and he would be doing this layering thing now that you see perhaps loopers do not as well. Um, and and then he would improvise over it and he would bring it up and down and hmm. it was a composition in the moment. And so we would do that in the band room. I would start it, I would show him how to do it. Then I would pull them up and have them start doing it with their colleagues. And usually you get the most outgoing first. You grab a drum major or someone who's used to being a leader. Um, and that's important too, because there's a big difference between a guest artist and a leader from within the ensemble, right? So the buy-in um, is important too, uh, to get them really involved. And then then step away and then they would take it over. And there now you have the ownership and the responsibility and, and not me doing it right because they can always rest on any of our um, energies but our, we're supposed to be the spark mm. not the engine yeah. i love that because it's 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 not about like it's not about like the the harmony it's not about two five one or or you know tritone substitution or even about the blue scale it's just about it's about listening and communicating and and being a being a, a leader but also being a partner that's great I mean, that's what music, that's what music is supposed to be, right? Yeah, it should be. Yeah. And then it's important to know too, that when we're teaching and we know this, but it's always great to say out loud, there's so many different learning styles, like that theory stuff you just told me still couldn't, you still can't do it. My brain freezes. No, me either. I just thought it sounded smart. <laughs> that's Chris's secret sauce is nobody ever fact checks him. Yeah. Cause he's, you know, principal trainer of the New York Philharmonic. He's got to be told telling the truth <laughs> know what he's talking about <laughs> i mean i i feel like it limits my vocabulary i, I it's like a, a a point of shame for me even though my mentors are like no no don't don't worry about it like even for arranging or again okay, i've you know that that group that that guy i'm pointing at hector martinio he's my, one of my musical partners and hector's like a big brother he's in his 60s now and he's like a top three in the world latin jazz pianist and he can do all that stuff he can't make it to a flight on time, but he, he can, he can like, he, and that's the difference. Like, you know, some um, of the most creative people I know can't make it to a podcast on time, <laughs> but that's what happens. In... <laughs> I love you. I'm sorry. I love you. I love you. I love oh, you the shade. Now, now we're, <laughs> but, now we got two trumpets talking to each other. There you go. Well, and it's a great opening to talk more about like that. Um, so, you know, we have these albums together and, and they did really, they're not, they're crossover albums, but they did really well in the jazz charts. Right. And that's some about content that some about promotion that some about it's a whole mirage and not a validator, but hmm. I, I can't record symbols. And, but if you write out the scale, I can flash on it like people flash on chord symbols. I don't need to look again. And then that's fine. But the letter representation of music does not make sense to my my brain. Never did. And so then I have to I have to honor that there's at least usually one person in the band or the orchestra or the trumpet section I'm working with when I'm clinicking. And you know, the darndest thing is, is as soon as I'm open and vulnerable about that out front, a good third of everyone I'm working with is like, you mean I'm not an idiot? Oh, that's empowering. You no, know, like, like that's great. You, yeah, other people are like me and they're looking around and no one's ever talked about this. I'm like, yeah, there's 20 plus learning styles, you know, and as a teacher, you know, we just have to keep giving them keys to replicate and try to open up things. and. Um, so I then looking back and like my first, the guy who started me, Mike Teolis, I helped him retire a couple of years ago and he's a, he's a fantastic trombonist. He started me in Chicago where I grew up and, um, he went to school with the guys from the group Chicago at Roosevelt. Right. Mm -hmm. And I stayed with him at his house when we did his retirement ceremony. He's at the piano, he's writing musicals every and singing and, 
Yeah. And right, and I'm watching. I'm like, I had no, and th- I had no idea. And I watch him teach us. He was teaching at the Latin school. I don't know if you ever went there, Chris, when we were in Chicago. Yeah. But yeah, and so maybe you met Mike. Um, and so he's like running around the band, picking up their instruments, playing them, showing them the fingerings, and playing it better than everyone there. I'm like, that's the way it used to be. Yeah, that's my fantasy. That's the way it used to be. Because when you listen to those recordings of doc or mendez with high school bands in the in this country that's the level i hear like we're all a gaga over the the japanese bands and they're doing so fantastic you know like the junior mm-hmm. high bands and they got everything memorized and and they sound amazing and mm-hmm. and they're doing their thing and i'm like i think that's the way it used to be um in our own style but like he's 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 uh he's the way it should be I, i'm assuming kind of mm-hmm. that's you know what your father is too um it's just like yes <clears throat> it's your whole I mean, yeah i think that's right my, 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 my father he's 75 and he's he retired from teaching theoretically last year but he's teaching more than he ever has been <laughs> flying all over the Not country surprising. Yeah. It's just it's it's uh what do we what do you call it? You call it like he's uh, he's a lifer, right? Like he's yeah. a lifer. Yeah. Like everybody everybody used to be a lifer in music. It seems yeah. like everybody, you know, I know that like in his in the in the drum corps he started, my father. He there's so many so many people, so many young people came through that group in the 70s and 80s who had almost like almost no musical background. They had a little bit of band and that was mm-hmm. it. And no, and they had no, no interest in becoming musicians, but they, they did this thing and it changed their life. It changed their lives for the better, not because, not because they became, you know, better and better brass players, but because they, they learned that music, music was community and music was, was family. And, um, that's to me, that's, that's a beautiful, I didn't expect it to go there talking about improvisation, but that's, that's, that's well, I mean, but that's that awesome. it goes to the, your, I, and let's keep going on what you just said, Chris, cause we're in agreement as usual is that music is community. And like, so how do you quantify to an educational institution or to a, um, a governor or, you know, a, a politician to keep funding music. Right. Yeah. And, and yeah. usually we're pointing to SAT scores and, and it's hard to quantify that but not really i mean um it just i think it needs to be shown the right way like it's interesting that we all get to make music and make money but that's Mm. that's an aberration that that's not really what it's about that and then once everyone gets oriented towards that as the goal that's the problem if if Mm. we're looking at people like your father or like mike teal is my my band director they're directly not uh, not one degree of separation but directly affecting at least 10,000 people in their life mm. and what they're training them to do is is like what else the up tries to do right and and succeeds at which is like what if the ideal model f- for society is the large ensemble or the small ensemble and that's what we know from traveling all across the world is that constantly we're running into people who may or may not look like us may or may not have the same religious beliefs same political beliefs same languages um the same way of being in the world except we can sit down and make something together we're not in opposition we're not competing yeah um and we're making something that's greater than the sum of its parts together immediately because of the the openness of music and we take roles and, and it's all in the name of harmony um uh, I, hold on. Yeah. Uh-oh. Uh, you, you guys know this, but maybe it would be okay for the podcast. If I play the piano over there, um, you tell me if you can hear me. Okay. Well, I won't be able to right. tell because I won't have the headphones on. So we could do, was, we could do thumbs up, thumbs down. We could do thumbs up. Okay. There you go. Okay. All right. While he goes over there, just to, you know, to his point, and he mentioned El Sistema in Venezuela once okay. years ago. When years ago, go sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. No, you're talking. Just, no, I was while well, you walked I was over getting there, paranoid I was, I was for a sec. No, I was just gonna tell a quick story. <laughs> <laughs> I'm giving you a, I'm giving you a walk-on story. Okay. Da, da, we'll da, give you the da, thumbs da, up da. when you start playing. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. Okay. It requires a little bit of talking though. Hold on. Okay. All right. Okay. <laughs> but, this is uh I do real over here. here. Yeah. All right. So like in the real world, not the music world, but the real world, 
Um, you'll have one faction or party saying, I'm right. And they'll, they'll say it quite forcefully. And then we'll have another faction or party saying, no, negating immediately what the other person is saying. I'm right, insistently. And they'll say this. Right? And then together, they'll try to talk over each other. And they'll say this. say that's a disagreement except in music we call that dissonance and then we realize that in order to have harmony we need dissonance right and we know in music that we can do this hmm. and we can put it in a context where all parties are seen and heard and honored and celebrated versus wrong or right, right? And this is a sneaky way we're taught. Like, this is never said. It's, it, it's, just, it's just a way of being, right? And then when, when we say music is a way of life, it's not about being a professional musician. That's just weird. It's, it's really weird that we get to make money doing what we're doing, unless you're an educator teaching this stuff. Right. But if we're a professional performer, I yeah. think our role is an inspiration, certainly. But um, maybe that shouldn't be the ultimate goal. I, I don't know. I think about this a lot because, like, um, what are we teaching? Like, what, what are we trying to create? Like, um, and maybe a blend of both is great. But could you hear all my stuff over there? Yeah, or? it's perfect. Yeah, it's beautiful. I think, yeah. uh, I, are, you, are, you, are you launching a run for the Senate? That was beautiful. I, you know, I am a senator here at ASU, but I believe it. I believe it after that. And I've been trying to. I uh, it, Halloween's coming up, and I, I actually have two box fulls of costumes because when I I used to teach uh, regularly at the Armed Forces School of Music, and you know they're all wearing. We all wear costumes. I, my choice of costume. I have twenty vests. I like my costume, and like um, you know the, then the uniform is a costume, and then so I would have them dress in different costumes I brought along and they it would help get them into an improvisatory state. Um, so as a, this is a long way of saying, I do still have a Harry Potter robe <laughs> and it looks like a, it looks exactly like a Senator Palpatine robe from star Wars. And I, I'm <laughs> dying to wear it in person to one of these Senate meetings. But, <laughs> but, and you know I'm tenured now and everything, but I'm still yeah. I don't I still don't have the guts to do that because that's con tenure it means costume time yeah, costume like time <laughs> wear, wear a, a robo. <laughs> <laughs> you given me an idea. I've uh, I've for years I'm gonna I'm gonna take this lowbrow for a second. For years I for years one of my life goals has been to find the perfect giraffe costume for Halloween, and I finally found it this year. So I think you've inspired me since I, since I'm tenured, I'm going to wear it. I'm going to wear it to rehearsal this year. <laughs> I think we have a rehearsal on Halloween and I think it's with Yop. So it's going to be perfect. Nice. I played a, I played a, a, with the Baltimore symphony for a kid's concert on Halloween, maybe five years ago. And, um, and I, the, the conductor was dressed like Harry Potter and uh, we uh, opened the, uh, the thing with uh, theme uh, with Hedwig's theme from, uh, from Harry Potter Nice. And there's a uh, there's a cool like tuba lick uh, towards the bottom of the um, of the first page, and the uh, the conductor had not looked back at me yet. This is only like you know ninety seconds into the concert, and um, and when he went back to uh, to give me the cue, uh, I he saw that I had a gigantic Elmo head on, so it looked like this huge Elmo was playing. And as he went to give me, he he visibly cracked up as he gave me the cue. And then, uh, and then afterwards, uh, I said to, while the, while the kids are all cheering, I said to Randy Campora, the amazing bass trombonist next to me, I said, that, that might've been the highlight of my career. And he said, that was the highlight of my career. So that was, uh, <laughs> we, uh, we shared a moment. So, and to, to make things actually, this was like, uh, this was more like six years ago. My son was two. He went dressed as Elmo. Uh, like in a full costume, and then I had the big Elmo head on. So yeah, there was a, there was a little symmetry there. So, <laughs> That's yeah. so did you know right. Sesame Street was founded by musicians? I had heard, I had heard that. I had heard yeah. that. I found that out from Bob. I met Bob. Bob. So um, you know, Canadian and 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 the principal 
New York Phil Brass Quintet, we used to do these Christmas shows. And about the ninth or tenth month in, I, I did that. The, Bob from Sesame Street, um, Phil Smith got him to, to be the narrator for the for the show, and and he narrated a Grimm's fairy tale. I think it was uh, the uh, the the one about the Christmas tree, <laughs> and so he's at rehearsal and and um, you know in that really dry room that you guys rehearse in sometimes um, that overlooks the steps that cross the street from Juilliard. Oh yeah 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 yeah. And so he's there. And so I went up to introduce myself and just to be cordial, right? And I froze and, and I'm looking at him and right in front of him, it's Bob. And I grew up watching the guy. And, and the next thing I know is I said, I said, can I hug you? <laughs> <laughs> yes. And he, he smiled and he opened his arms and gave me the biggest, Aww. most beautiful hug. And then in the middle of it, I was just, I, I snapped out of my trance. I'm like, and I stepped back and I said, I'm so sorry. And he, and he was so kind. He says, you know, I'm, he says, please don't be this, this happens all the time to me. And I'm just honored to be a part of your childhood. That's fantastic. Like, That's really and, great. You opened with, can I hug you? I love it. That's but great. It just froze. And, and then I told, I told him my Sesame Street story from across the street from Lincoln Center tree lighting from 1996. And that's when I met Big Bird and um the grouch and um i knew we were um, going to be getting to the name dropping part of like two trumpets on the pie here it is yeah like i know big bird <laughs> i know oscar the grouch and but it was it was a really it, it was it, it was freezing outside and it was it was meridian my first group and we did right. we, we did this tree lighting and um it was freezing so the valves would freeze and we would have to take turns going over to the heater and and so wow. and but it was weird because we were behind these these metal barriers the gates and there was a press corps there like old style like you know news city that i imagine they had the hats hat on that they had old style cameras before digital and they're pushing in and 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 next th thing you know they they rush they push over the barrier and rush to the stage to because the whole sesame street cast is on stage and they're pushing our horn player and our tuba player is pushing them back because it's like we're playing and they're like bam you can like get dents in our i think there was a dent in the horn player's horn and like watch out wow. for my chops he was like turn violent like the i've never and i was like this is sesame street what are you doing rushing the stage it's not like a <laughs> <laughs> Weird. Big, Bird, Big Bird's been political a lot longer than we thought. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so Bob, I asked him how he, they started. <laughs> I, I I asked Bob how they started, and 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 he said that they started in a warehouse in in Brooklyn, um, yeah. and they seemed to be all musicians and kind of theater people, and um, but they I was like, how come you all sing so well? He says, we're all we're all musicians. Wow. Beautiful. There you go. Yeah. Oh, no. the people like us started awesome. Sesame Street. So I got to uh, I got to pay the bills here. Uh, this is for longtime listeners. They're going to find this funny because uh, right before uh, Chris Martin hopped on with me so that we could chat about this, I realized that I did not have the ad copy for Duquesne for the spot that's been going for like five years. And I looked and I don't know whether Lance just didn't keep it in the uh, Google Drive or whether he just ad libs it. So uh, but it's not in there. So here we go. So uh, did you know that you can uh, study brass instruments uh, at uh, at Duquesne University? Maybe you'll end up, uh, you know, studying with Big Bird, who is uh, who's very political in lessons. Uh, no, there's not. There's no no Big Bird in there. Um, but I, I do know that they there's a, a link in the show notes, as always, uh, to be able to. The faculty there is incredible. Um, you know, Jim Gorlay. Uh, there's like a long list of amazing teachers and also Jim Nova. Um, and uh, but you should absolutely uh, check it out. They've been a longtime supporter. Uh, they've got some really, really great stuff happening there. And Pittsburgh is a happening town, which like the only people who don't say nice things about Pittsburgh are people who haven't been to Pittsburgh, because I think it's a really cool town with a lot of very cool uh, art stuff happening there. And a lot of opportunities, by the way, that's the kind of town where what Joe was talking about with um, 
But boy, did this leave a mark, by the way, when you were talking about how when you were a student at ASU that you were approaching bands and offering to work with them for free in exchange for soloing with them and that you were doing 10 a semester. That's like talk about a call to action for wow. young people because that's like, you know how much it costs to reach out to a band director and offer that? Absolutely nothing. It costs your time and that's it. And you're going to hear no sometimes and you're going to hear get no answer sometimes. And if you do it enough, you're going to hear yes. And if you're thoughtful enough about it, uh, but Pittsburgh is like is a dream type place to be able to do that because there's just a lot of stuff happening there. So uh, thank you to uh, to Duquesne uh, for uh, to the Mary Papert School of Music for supporting the Brass Junkies. And I'm also supposed to give uh, Jim a nickname, which is what Lance has done every single episode forever. So uh, and a special thank you to Jim Redacted Nova uh, for uh, for helping to support uh, the show. There we go. And I'm gonna um, I'm gonna jump in and say it, that it uh, <clears throat> that it, uh, we've got the, Duquesne also has uh, the great Micah Wilkinson teaching trumpet. Yes, the, and uh, uh, fellow yes. fellow Atlantan. We we uh, had the same teachers growing up, and a, 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 a beautiful player, great person, and a great teacher. And uh, Christopher Wilson is also there. Um, he started there this year. There's like, yeah, it's a it's a it's a really wonderful uh, faculty. Mm. So yeah, and and Jim Nova. So, um, yeah, anyway, uh, moving right along. Uh, this is flown by, by the way, and I knew it would. Like, you're, um, yeah, Joe, you're, I, I love how, uh, and actually, let, let me say some nice things about you here. Um, your, your answers to all, like, just this conversation, it reminds me of your trumpet playing, which is that it's, like, it's very thoughtful. It's like, it, it feels mm. like, it just feels like everything is, I, I remember the first time that you and I played together, which was, at like either an Easter or a Christmas Eve gig. Um, well, you know. we had a pretty good quintet together. Oh yeah, no, yeah. yes, it was, so it was killer. You and Julie, my wife, who's a, a world class conductor, but a great, great trumpet player. Yes, she is. You and I, and then Denise Tryon Horn, and awesome. um, awesome. and then uh, Hiram Diaz. Hiram Hiram Diaz, Diaz who's oh, the you euphonium guys... soloist with the Marine Band, yeah, but who plays a up. great yeah. trombone. He's yeah. going to be here actually in Phoenix uh, in about a month, and so nice. will Kevin. Kevin Jebo will be here too. There you go. Um, oh, great just, people. Yeah, man. I bet, thing... I bet Benkel Sanger leader never sounded better when you guys played. <laughs> <laughs> Hiram and I are actually splitting the uh, the uh, Jonathan Fowler is on sabbatical. Uh, who's the tuba euphonium professor at Westchester University, and I'm teaching the tubas this semester, and Hiram is teaching the euphoniums. So we are uh, oh, we're like two ships passing in the night uh, in the hallways uh, at times. But um, but yeah, but that that quintet was great. But I just remember. Like, you know, instantly, first of all, I remember you and I, after like the very first rehearsal, we kind of had a moment where it's like, yeah, you've done this quintet thing before, you know, where it was just like yeah. so easy to play with you. But you're the you're the kind of player that I that uh, that I enjoy playing because it literally does make my job easier because you're like you're giving strong opinions and yet you're fully ready and uh, looking to change your opinion due to the data that's incoming as well you know i mean and that's kind of the if that makes sense that was a little bit of an awkward way to put it but it's like exclamation points but also looking to collaborate at the same time it's maybe a little bit of a cleaner way to put it and that's um something you get a lot of people with question marks and then you get a lot some people with like exclamation points like this is how this goes um and both of you have a resume and being in that that lead trumpet seat in a quintet or an orchestra you can you can get away with just exclamation points and just kind of dictating, but like, yeah, I mean, yeah, you know, to the I, detriment of the product. Though, yes, right? absolutely. A hundred percent. When yeah. I say get away with, I just mean like, that's not going to like yeah. run you a foul of like, you know, like of mm -hmm. any, you know, rules or regulations, if you will. But the greats is just like the great conductors, um, you know, that, uh, that was mentioned before. It's like, you know, the exclamation points, but also the, Oh, but actually we should try it that way that you just hinted at, um, and the great thing is, is that you, you know, you do that from, you know, the, the great lead trumpet players in quintets that I've played with, and I've played with a bunch at this point, I'm very spoiled in that regard, but are like willing to take that direction um, from like something the tuba does or something the trombone does and a feature role in the piece or in a backup role. I mean, any of that. And you're a really great example of that. So thank you for making my job easier. Thanks. Beautiful. Beautiful. It's great to play with you. Yeah. You know, was, when, uh, when, the, when the first, when the first trumpet in the tuba lock, you know, lock uh, musically, you know, intonationally, but also, but also just like emotionally, psych, intellectually, when you lock, everything else fits. Yes. Everything else fits. 
I, I, remember, I, I remember one of my one of my my first rehearsal with the New York Phil. Uh, that this this happened, and 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 uh, I remember I, I played something, and Al Bear looked down. Bring Al in again. Um, Al Bear looked down, and he said, "Are you really going to play it like that?" And I was like, "No." What, how would you like me to play it? He's like, no, no, I'm just asking. Is that really how you're going to play it? Like, I was just, <laughs> and it was right then that I knew I got to get, I got to keep, I got to get this job. This is great. <laughs> you know what he could have said? He could have leaned down and said, Hey, I really, I really like what you tried to do there. Chris. <laughs> <laughs> Never heard of it like that. <laughs> Rather play with you than the best trumpet players in town. Thank you. <laughs> oh. Yes. <laughs> I've heard them all. I've heard them all. Wait, you mean that's not a good thing? Yeah. I anytime it doesn't happen a lot, but anytime I sub with the National Symphony because they're all great guys, I always end with like I'd rather play with you guys than the best guys in town. So which they always get a you know they always get a good chuckle. <laughs> Since, you know they're like power brokers of like who gets to play what around here. So you know it's just get a little bit as insulting in a loving way, and it's funny because you know people are generally like you know oh, oh that, yeah that's how brass players show affection. Yep. Yeah. The rest of development, all that. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's nothing to unpack there psychologically. That that's my default. Yeah. That I, I never use humor to deflect from you know, uncomfortable social uh, or, you know, situations or spiritual crises. So yeah, I never, ever, ever do that. So, uh, Joe, we're like I said, this is flown by. Like we're like we're close to out of time. Cool. Um, what was it? Um, well, and we are going to have you uh, stick around for the bonus episode, uh, which okay. is going to just be a, a slight continuation. And we'll uh, we'll ask some of the usual questions uh, of that, which will be for our Patreon patrons. Um, nice. What was it like getting the job with Canadian Brass when you first got that job? Um, you got another hour? <laughs> yeah, fair enough. We've got 30 well, seconds. It, yeah, here's this okay, massive so question. Well, I got a, okay. I got a, yeah, I got a specific question too. Yeah. Like, w did you just plug in? Or did you did did you spend a bunch of time rehearsing with them, or did you just like you're the guy, jump in, go on tour, that's it? Uh, just plugged in, uh, and so you know we hit the ground running. Um, that's an awesome lesson for people out there. Can you yeah. imagine? Imagine like the 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 library of rep you had to learn, or just yeah, plug but in and go. I mean we've all learned how to learn quickly, right? Um, yeah. Well they sent for the audition. They sent me thirty-three pieces the day before. The day before. The, the day wow. before, and the, then wow. there was six hours of playing for the audition. Wow. Um, but it, it. I wow. mean, everything builds, right? So, you know, we've been talking about the people who, who your father, my band director, our teachers. We stand on their shoulders. So yeah. it's not like our knowledge comes from nowhere we're just continuing a tradition um canadian brass is is certainly part of of our dna as brass players yep. um and so it was the first poster i had on my wall yeah kid yeah um and you know is on pbs back in the day when there were only four tv channels in pbs you would see canadian brass and, and winton and those were my heroes you know mm -hmm. now then they, who you could see here on the radio and um, but getting into that group, uh, um, I'm still unpacking as I, I get more mature as a person and a player, what I learned there. Uh, I knew immediately that I, that this was, uh, I was stepping in, into something that I had not created. And I really honored that. I mean, it, it, mm -hmm. I didn't deserve to be there. And I, I don't think anyone who went into that group and I say, I, I like every, all the players who came after the. The, the real core originals. But if you think about Ron and Fred and Gene and Chuck, and then if you put David and kind of Marty both in there, but mostly David, he spent the most time there. Hmm. You're talking about at that point when I got into the group, 35 years of their life energy they had hmm. put into that group. And and the sacrifice of, to the you know, about the sacrifice one made when they're making a group like that is family sacrifice is personal sacrifice and it's and it, it, they do make i mean the what they do make the world a better place by the inspiration they're putting out there and because yeah. we're all an example of the, you know people who were inspired by them mm -hmm. um so I, I looked at it as an honor to 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 and, and that sounds like a weird facebook crap to say an honor i'm honored yeah. to do this I, um but to 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 
to contribute to that tradition, but I didn't start it, you know. And, but you uh, but you expanded it. You certainly expanded I, it. I contributed to expanding it, sure. You're an important um, part of that of that story. Yeah. And by the way, yeah, have I mentioned that Joe is thoughtful? Yeah, that, like that answer is like, yeah, you're making my point, right? Where it's just right. like where you didn't just like uh and that's a great question from Chris. Like, did you just plug in or was there a long and that that's another call to action, right? For right. uh for young but musicians. I mean, Be ready. You know, you, you can drop yeah. y- yourself or Chris in any ensemble in the world and and you can sight read and still sound like you've been there for years because it, it's not so much about the music, but it is about the partnering skills and understanding yes. about, and of course the understanding of the technique and playing the horn that can allow you to partner like that. But it mm-hmm. is about listening and responding and playing an, an appropriate appropriately and mm-hmm. in a way that is gathering versus dominating and, um, mm-hmm. And those those are the skills, right? It's, it's not necessarily the notes on the page. And then we get into a jazz thing, you know. Why do the jazzers say play what's you know what's in between the notes? Because that's what they're talking about. They're talking about the energy in there, and mm. and and maybe the flow, you know. Um, yeah. But it's uh, yeah. So I would say if anyone, if, if there's a 17 year old out there who's impressed by, oh well, these guys can just sit anywhere and kind of you know, they're up to speed. It's because it takes a lot of daily dedication and uh, to that craft and to that art and it takes loving it too. Um, and it's not something that happens all at once. And, and it's not, it's not like you can watch, I've been building our baby's room and, and reacquainting myself with the more modern up to code electrical wiring things and laying a floor and you can go on YouTube and you can get a, a tutorial how to do that. And, and get the basics and certainly there are masters of this craft but music is a lifelong pursuit and then mm. and then life is over right you try to get that's right that's right what is that what is that what is that uh what is it i wake up every day and uh do battle with the trumpet and some days i win some days the trumpet wins until the end and you're dead and the trumpet still wins <laughs> <Not that>. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's, uh, that's yeah. funny. Yeah, yeah. Yep. You do. Uh, I guess we all do lose the ultimate battle. Yeah. Right. <laughs> wow, that's gotta... uh, that's that's amazing. Uh, you know, and uh, again, uh, to you know, a lesson for for again for young musicians is that you might think that if you get the opportunity to sub in any seat with the New York Philharmonic on anything could be big rep could be just uh, a kid concert which i think are very very important and that's why i, I just used air quotes if you're only listening and, to this um, and sometimes they have the hardest rep yes uh, yeah absolutely yeah. um but uh it doesn't matter what it is like you might think that like when you're on stage with like chris martin and joe alessi like that that you just kind of want to like stay out of the way and just kind of like you know keep but but actually, they want you to play with an opinion. They don't want you to lead from the third trumpet seat. But it's like, but but you need to like state an opinion of some kind. And it's a lot easier to play with opinionated musicians than it is to play with musicians who are trying to stay out of the way. Uh, and so, which can kind of run counterintuitive to circle all the way back. Let's pretend I did this on purpose uh, to the very very beginning of this when you were you know you were talking about how passive a lot of large ensemble playing is right where it can be it can be just be a very passive like mm-hmm. you wait you tell me when to play how to play it uh, you know all of the above right um yeah but that's not what anybody uh in the back row or back couple of rows of the new york philharmonic is doing right like there's there's nothing passive happening back there um that's not what's happening in canadian brass that's not what is happening anywhere and so um yeah you gotta if you've done your homework which is uh, the important part because both of the gentlemen on the screen with me here have done their homework such as they can play high and low and uh, loud and you know and soft and etc uh, and all the combinations they're in but you got to play with with a with a point of view yeah i mean to joe to joe's one of joe's original points which is so brilliant like music is music is conversation and yes and whether that whether you're in a brass quintet, whether you're in concert band, whether you're in a trumpet section in an orchestra, uh, sometimes you lead, sometimes you listen, sometimes you follow, and sometimes you sometimes you say the same thing at the same time, uh, in a in slightly different way, or in the same. And and so that's music is conversation. And if if I think if we can if we can look at you know look at every situation we're in as players in that in that way, 
see that we have a role to listen and we have a role to speak. It's great. Oh, good stuff. Also beautifully said. Yeah, there we go. So, uh, yeah, should should we tack on like five more forced minutes, you know, just so that we don't end on such a poignant note, or should we just uh, should we just wrap it right there? That's the beautiful thing about running this show. There is no hard break. It's like no, you have to fill three more minutes until the traffic report, which is on the eighth. <laughs> so, um, no, that was um, wonderful, Joe. Thank you so much uh, for uh, for for joining us, and Chris, thank you for uh, for being the the first. Uh, you did. This is a little awkward. I'll just say it. You did a way better job than Lance did in any of the 200 previous episodes. So, yeah, so. You know, you know they, you know how they say, never be the guy who follows the guy. Yeah, so I, I, I know where I'm headed after this. <laughs> oh wait, wait a minute! I completely forgot about. Uh, so, so uh, Joe, I'm putting you on the spot here because yeah. I, have, I decided that I'm going to have people. Uh, re- <laughs> this is funny. I'm, I'm revealing the gag before it even happens. I'm going to have people remember Lance, like kind of like quasi sounding as if he's not with us anymore, which he very much is, but he's just mm-hmm. not on the podcast anymore. So do you have any thoughts uh, about like remembering the, the honor and the memory of Lance LaDuke? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> what better way to honor him? <laughs> No, I, I don't even know who that is. Yeah, it's like <laughs> I, I, know, I know who Lance is. It's just it's my first time on the show. It's like your two hundred first episode. I, I feel so honored. In the in the time we've recorded this, he's uh, already published twelve more books. Uh, yeah, to right? be fair, I mean to be fair, you've been asking me for many years, and I've just been avoiding you. Yeah. <laughs> Well, see, now I, I do want to point out, I just want to point out, in closing, I want to point out that when Lance was here, like Joe was always like, oh, yeah, man, like I'll get back to you. Like, absolutely, yeah. we should do, we got to make that happen. And then as soon as I'm like, hey, man, Lance isn't here, like, you know, Chris Martin, he's like, how's uh, Saturday morning at 7 a.m., which is literally when he's doing this. It's the next weekend morning at 7 a.m., and then here we are. So, yeah, but draw it's, your important, own conclusions. it's important to note, Lance, to make the 7 a.m. show. I've been up since four. Yeah. <laughs> no, you've been up since one thirty. <laughs> I would. I was. I, I was wondering whether Chris was going to point out that you weren't on time again, but he, he took the high road. So he's he's emotionally matured in the last like twenty five minutes. So that's, listening uh, to listening to Joe do that to you. Yeah, yeah that's true. All right. So uh, everyone, mature or decay? I think emotionally decay <laughs> would be more apropos here he just, he just doesn't care enough to bring it back up so or he has self-awareness and he doesn't go back to the well more than once i'm like everybody laughed i should say it eight more times because i'll just get like that'll be nine times the laughs well, right it's like, i it's like, like that re- doesn't work yeah, well you and i have agreed then repetition equals humor <laughs> <That's> like, <laughs> i'm yes. going to i'm going to go upstairs and tell my amazing wife say the incredibly world-renowned Joe Bergstaller says repetition equals humor. So I'm right, and you're wrong. That's that's well, I, it. I think I, I, my 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 fantasy is that's an Austrian trait. I I never I never knew I was funny, um, until I sat down with the 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 guys uh, from Vienna Phil. Hans Gantz was there in Limoges, uh, the the festival there, and and so. German was my first language, so we start talking, and a Canadian was there, and no one was ever laughing at my stuff in Canadian. I, I kept repeating it, like, "Did you hear what I said?" That's funny. Um, and then the, we were crying, laughing together, and I, I would look around, and, and, and you know, and and as I was, it was the it was Hans Hans, and then um, uh, it, it was his quintet that he used to have. Um, and oh yeah, 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 so, yeah. yeah. Uh, I forget everyone's name, but we were all crying laughing. And then I realized I had an Austrian sense of humor and it just doesn't always translate. Um, and so, you know, it just, it, what it means here is that when people don't get my humor, uh, they're wrong. So I've, not, <laughs> I've now got a new thing on my bucket list is that I want to go to Austria with you so that I can experience funny Joe Bergstaller. That's yes. Uh, yeah. And we would also eat, we would eat Minish so three times a day yeah we would eat no vegetables because they don't have any there oh they do they're the bad the best salads but that's for cows (laughs) (laughs) you eat the cow to get the salad yes yeah yeah. you know it you know it's bad and i love i could eat there for a long time but you know it's bad when like it makes my radar be like you know i haven't 
I haven't seen anything green in like six days. Like, yeah, there's like, there's no, there's nothing. Yeah, there's nothing. Anyway. All right. I got, uh, I got a Hans Gunn story real quick. Oh, please. Yeah. Yes. I was, I was playing with him in, J in Japan years ago. He, uh, we were yeah. doing Votek. He was playing first. I was playing second. <clears throat> and, you know, Votek has a bunch of high, soft stuff, a bunch of muted stuff too, you know. And he's playing through like some soft high B like with his mute in. And it's like, he sounds great. And he's like, oh, this is kind of hard work. And I said, you want to try my mute? So I gave him one of those uh, Trumcore black mutes, you know. Yeah. Nice, nice New soft technology. Yeah. yeah. So I gave it to him and he put it in and he plays the lick and he pops a high E flat out instead of a B. And he's like, nah, too easy. No, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> He's awesome. He's awesome. Right? And how how many trumpet players don't know who he is? That's Yeah. Like, I, I, none of my know? none of none of my students new students know who he is. Nobody knows. And I play I play them that Alpine Symphony recording and then they all Yeah, the video they, that Tomas yeah. put have you seen the video that Tomas put yeah. on on YouTube? Yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah. I mean, believable because I know who he is, but amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And that was a, that was go. such a long time ago now by by uh by young people standards. Crazy. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah, the both both of them. It's like, I don't. Has there ever been uh, two brothers with that much talent in the same uh, family in the trumpet world? No. <laughs> On that note. Nope. <laughs> nope. There On hasn't. that note, uh, Joe, thank you. Chris, thank you. Uh, for uh, all of you uh, Patreon patrons, uh, which you can uh, become by going to patreon.com slash the Brass Junkies, uh, you will get access to a bonus episode with, uh, with Joe, uh, as well as a long list of people. Um, and in addition to some other uh, bonus content, there's some brand new stuff that's been coming out uh, over the last month that is going to continue. Thank you to everyone for your support and uh and genuinely thank you to uh to lance uh with episode 200 was like all uh, it was just a big like giant love fest uh, about lance uh, and then the bonus episode was in more love for lance um but i'm i'm not gonna this is the last time that i'm gonna say anything nice about him we're just gonna get the guest to pretend like he has uh passed away uh and uh, pay him tribute except for joe just wasn't in the mood so uh which i like yeah. uh anyway thank you and that is gonna do it for another episode of the brass junkies Pray for Lance. <laughs>